Hi, I'm Lauren Young. I'm a digital special projects editor at Reuters, and I'm so happy you could join us today on a beautiful Monday to discuss the great retirement reboot. Um, to kick off today's event, I would like to invent, invite my friend from Prudential, Harry Delasad. Okay, now I already um, butchered your name, Harry, and I apologize, <laughs> Delasio, to join us and to kick it off and to introduce everyone. Thank you, and take it away, Harry. All good, Lauren. Thank you. Um, and, and good afternoon, everyone, and, and certainly happy Monday. Uh, this year has been nothing anyone predicted or expected, and our world certainly has more uncertainty than ever before, especially in our health and well being, our work, our families, our economy, our society, and we're navigating a whole host of risks and far reaching impacts of the pandemic. As we recognize all this change, it's important that we acknowledge another reality, which is what we're gonna get into a, a, a bunch today. Similar to other economic downturns, COVID certainly highlighted that many Americans are, are unprepared for their futures. And this is the second major crisis in 12 years. This one certainly had a health aspect and a financial aspect to it. And it's likely to have far reaching implications for savings behavior for different age groups and also far reaching implications for whether workers will be able to retire on time. As industry leaders in the retirement space, we have the responsibility to the people we serve to prepare them. And it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when the next crisis occurs. History has shown us that we'll come out of this, as was the case in the years following the 08, 08 and 09 downturn. The question is, what will we do differently now? And there's a lot of new challenges that organizations are facing right now but at some point we need to take the time to pause and reassess retirement plans to make sure they are protecting and driving outcomes through the good times and the bad. So as a starting point during retirement plan evaluations, we need to determine if three core components are in place. First, smart plan design. Second, creating an income stream for life. And third, reinforcing and enabling financial wellness. One of the biggest opportunities right now is that second component I mentioned an income for life strategy. Now is the time to reassess your retirement plan, take an honest look and determine, is this truly a retirement plan or is it a savings account? And why do I say that? Because defined contribution plans when they were first introduced were set up to be supplemental savings for fully funded defined benefit plans. Now defined contribution plans have become the primary retirement vehicle for many US workers. So while the role of DC plans has evolved, plan design in a lot of cases has not. DC plans need to make the shift from being a savings account with tax benefits to becoming a real solid retirement plan for the, the many years uh, ahead for US workers. And the missing link to that compared to defined benefit plans has been enabling individuals with a mechanism to create that paycheck like a pension plan would that will last in and through retirement. So they're protected during times of significant market downturns like what we've just experienced and continue to experience. So what's happening with COVID shows us that there's a need for that level of protection. By no means can we control the American workers' everyday financial habits, but we can get them on the right track. We have the capabilities that will help set them up to build the financial future they want and deserve. Now is the time for all Americans to have a financial foundation to build on because it's so critical that every American worker has a retirement they could count on. So thank you all for joining us today and expect a great conversation. Harry Delessio, thank you very much. You nailed it. Us. I know, I'm thank kicking you. us off. Um, I want to introduce our panel, which was hand selected by me. Thank you very much. Um, first and foremost, we have Christine Benz from Morningstar. We have Kedra Newsom, who is joining us from BCG, Boston Consulting Group. We have our retirement columnist at Reuters, Mark Miller, who is a, a longtime friend of mine. Thank you, Mark. And then finally, we have Teresa Gilarducci, whose name I almost butchered, but got it. Uh, and Teresa is a professor at the New School who has studied retirement. She's currently on leave, but she's one of my gurus in the world of retirement. So I'm just gonna kick it off and um, ask Mark, if you wouldn't mind just telling people how the pandemic has already impacted retirement planning since you've been writing about it for the past eight months. Thanks, thanks, Lauren. You know, I think 
just as a point of general framing, the way I look at the way the pandemic is impacting the economy and retirement, um, you know, I think we're still in the early innings on this and forecasting is hard. Uh, Teresa's an economist, she'll have more to say, I'm sure about this, but I look at it as something that is still unfolding and is likely to for several years. You know, the, you know, the, this year we've seen drops in employment and it's been very specific to certain kinds of industries. Some have held up, some have not. You know, where this is going yet, I think is kind of a, an open question in many respects. But when you look at the impact this year, it's been interesting. You know, we haven't really seen a whole lot of a drawing down from retirement savings accounts, uh, as I think a lot of us were concerned we would see, especially with the provisions of the CARES Act, which really liberalized uh, the rules for drawdowns. It's been somewhat limited. I, I speculate that that's because um, the folks who tend to have 401ks tend to work in larger enterprises where perhaps job loss has been less concentrated. And if you look at the sort of the parts of the economy, small businesses, for example, uh, that are less likely to have uh, retirement plans and perhaps where layoffs have been more concentrated. So th that hasn't happened. But I think what, what we are seeing is a big, big disruption to the sort of the timing of retirement. You know, even before the pandemic, most of the research suggested that maybe half of people retire uh, according to when they think they will and hoped and planned that they will. You know, things get in the way, health problems, job loss, job burnout, other factors. And I think there's good reason to think that, it, that that's accelerating at this point. And so it, there's implications there for, uh, for retirement planning and security because I think the timing of retirement is probably one of the very most important elements in a, in a secure retirement plan. And changes of just a few years can really have a huge impact. Absolutely, Mark. Um, I want to tell people who are watching, if you do have questions for our panelists, please put them in the chat function and they will get um, sent to me and we'll have time for Q&A at the end of this. Uh, Kedra, I wanted to ask you, because people did expect so many um, retirement plan participants to be tapping the retirement accounts and we saw legislation that let them do that. Why do you think that hasn't happened right now? And um, are you concerned going forward in terms of how people are saving in 2020, if at all? Yeah, I mean, I think Mark said it in his, his, his comments a bit is that I think those folks that have retirement plans are largely not those folks that have been experiencing um, layoffs and as much financial challenges um, as others. If we just look at the Black and Latinx community, Black and Latinx people are more overrepresented in those service occupations where we did see both job loss, but also a lack of retirement benefits. So I don't think that people necessarily that have 401ks and DC plans necessarily needed to access um, the, those funds. And in, in fact, probably many of them were, were saving more um, due to not traveling, not having to go to work uh, into the office, not taking vacations, et cetera. By the way, Kedra did a, an amazing TED Talk, which you should look up, on the racial wealth gap. So I highly recommend um, for, for further retirement reading. Um, Christine, I want to go to you. I know you've also done a lot of work looking at um, just portfolio construction in general. And are people going into the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic, are their portfolios aligned properly for what we've seen in 2020? It's a really good question, Lauren. One feature of this pandemic and the economic stimulus put in place to, to help stave off a recession has been um, a massive lowering of interest rates. And so certainly for people constructing retirement portfolios, especially retirees who have been counseled that they need to have those safe income producing assets in their portfolios, we've seen yields shrivel to like, you know, 1%. And so I think it's a really vexing time for people to be creating retirement portfolios because we've also had a tremendous rise in the stock market. And so I do suspect that there's a fair amount of complacency about having stock market risk in, in portfolios. People have had such a great re recovery in their equity portfolios since stocks dropped so much back in the last crisis and sort of the 2008 period. So my fear is that that combination of strong equity market returns and very low yields has people 
overly risky in terms of the complexion of their investment portfolios. And as Mark referenced, the timing of retirement is so important that if you happen to retire into a period of both really low yields, which we have today, as well as not inexpensive equity valuations, and you're simultaneously taking more out of that portfolio than you should be, it means that if we do encounter a downturn, there's less in place of your portfolio to recover when stocks eventually do. So I think it's a, a concerning time for people putting together retirement portfolios. We could absolutely do an entire webinar just on the timing of retirement and when, when to do it. But Teresa, I wanted to ask you, I know you've done so much research, uh, particularly on um, more mature workers. Can you talk a little bit about the timing of retirement and if you think it's going to be shifting out of the pandemic in terms of what the retirement age would should be, would be? Um, thank you, Lauren. That's exactly what I wanted to talk about. I completely agree with Mark um, that if you look at our models, uh, any model, about what makes a, um, a person a secure retiree, you have to look at their job, at their um, job trajectory. And what you do in those last 15 years before age 65 or 67 really determines the path of your, your entire year. Um, and what we're finding is that people are going to be leaving their jobs a lot sooner than they had planned. So we gave people pamphlets and, literate, and financial literacy and we hammered in um, the message um, to people that they needed to um, plan to work as long as possible. They needed to take advantage of the social security increase in benefits um, all the way up to age 70. You know, on a, a spreadsheet, it looked fine. If you save 10% of your income, and now what Christine has pointed out is our existential problem, that a safe portfolio is going to yield a lot less than we had hoped back in the 80s and 90s when we were pushing 401ks, people are going to have to save 15% of their income from the very first time they work. And on a spreadsheet, that looks fine if you work until you're 65 or up to 67. Right now, most people, Mark said it very fast, and I just want to put it in yellow highlights. Most people retire earlier than they had planned. So forget about the pamphlets, forget about your, um, your best intentions. Your employer has different plans for you. So I want to focus attention here on what's happening on the demand side, on the employer side. Right now, we have a pandemic that is hurting affecting older people more than younger people. Therefore, people focus on sort of worker behavior. Are they reluctant to work? Employers are reluctant to actually provide the PPE you need for older workers. Um, and therefore they're wanting to actually not have the stimulus, have Congress pass the stimulus unless they have liability protection. But right now they're on the hook for paid sick leave for um, other, um, for disability. So I, they also are in a period where there has been lax um, enforcement of age discrimination laws. We've had four years of a very lax, um, not a pro worker labor department. Um, so employers seem to be taking the once in a lifetime opportunity to let wor older workers go much faster than they did in the past. For the first time in 50 years, we're seeing older workers have higher unemployment rates than younger workers. We are also seeing for the first time that even if you are able to keep your job, the, the people that Kedra talked about, the, the lucky of us in the, in the up part of the K-shaped recession, keep our jobs and we have a retirement plan, employers um, are dropping their voluntary contributions to 401k. We don't have a good census of that. We're getting anecdotal data, but this is probably, they're dropping contributions um, in the 401k at probably twice the amount they did in, the, in 2008. So even if workers want to save, their employers are really moving back from their accumulated. So Lauren, real, just real quickly, I see that this part of the boomers, you know, who are about ready to retire, they've been hit twice. One was when they were in their 50s with a 2008 financial recession. And now, um, and now this 12 years later, that their accumulation um, is way off the mark from what we had hoped for when they were in their um, 20s and 30s. And if I can say it to everybody, 
it really exposes the fatal flaws of our retirement system, where we really rely way too much on the part of our system that can't take the risk, don't have the, um, the professional advice to manage their own portfolios, and we don't have universal coverage for pensions. It's really, um, it's like when the tide comes in, you know, goes out, and all the garbage is left on the beach. The COVID recession is just showing all the garbage of our um, of our retirement system. I so um, I wouldn't say it's the most beautiful picture that you painted, Teresa, but it is a very apt analogy. Um, and I want to remind people who are joining us: please ask questions. We will be leaving uh, time for Q and A at the end. Christine, knowing all of that, knowing the the setup, um, do you think that retirement age should be extended, or do you? think that that's wishful thinking because companies are just going to push people out anyway. Well, I think that certainly individuals who are thinking about their careers should think about extending their own retirement dates if they possibly can. But as Mark and Teresa noted, there is what we call at Morningstar retirement date risk, that you're not as much in charge of this as you like to think you are. So there are, are risks at the employer level there are health risks, certainly, and this pandemic has exposed that plenty of people are working in jobs where there are frontline health risks. Um, so there are things, spouses' health risks, parent health risks, a lot of factors can derail your own good intentions of delaying retirement um, if you possibly can. So, you know, as Mark has always said, it's a worthy aspiration, but it's not a plan. And one other wrinkle I would add to this, to Teresa's comments about the job loss at, at the older age court, cohorts, is that historically older age workers have taken a longer time to replace jobs that they've lost. So if they have been able to replace them, it's just taken them much longer than younger workers. And it stands to reason, sometimes they're in more specialized career paths at that later life stage. But even if they, in a best case scenario, are able to find a new job, it might take more like 18 months versus uh, less than a year for younger workers. So that's another wrinkle as well. Mark, I think I saw you waving your hand. Yeah, I was gonna actually ask a question to Christine. Uh, do I recall right, I think some Morningstar research, I think David Blanchett um, had done a study that the longer you plan to work, the risk to your plan rises, that the more ambitious you are, with your uh, projected retirement date, the risk of the plan is higher. Do I remember that correctly? You do, Mark. It's it's really counterintuitive, but the basic idea right. that if your plan is riding on you working longer, delaying, deferring retirement portfolio withdrawals, um, it might mean that you are planning on having additional savings between yeah. now and retirement. If yeah, you fall and, short of that and, retirement date, yeah. your whole plan falls short. And, and just to kind of put a bow on this, I think, you know, when you think about the sensitivity of retirement dates, there's a number of factors involved. If you're retiring prematurely, first, it makes it less likely that you'll be able to delay Social Security filing, getting the higher monthly benefit. But it also means fewer years of saving for retirement. It means, by definition, uh, more years of relying on your savings uh, in retirement it may well mean fewer years, probably means fewer years of employer subsidized health insurance. So there's any number of factors that, you know, lots of research shows that this is maybe like the most important kind of hinge point in, uh, in outcomes that, that there is. And um, folks in, their, in that ramp window to retirement, let's say age 55 and higher, but that's a little arbitrary, uh, who have lost jobs, you know, are, you're probably retired and don't know it yet, because given the likelihood of this recession persisting, maybe unevenly from industry to industry, uh, a lot of these folks just are not going back. And so they're going to have to find ways to, to triage the plan. I mean, Teresa, you've done a bunch of work on this in terms of just the labor force and what segments and what industries are getting hit the hardest. Maybe you could comment on some of that. Hospitality for sure, right, Teresa? Yeah, it's, it's, it's hospitality, but it's actually older workers and um, women workers and, um, and non-white workers um, with lower, um, the bottom two thirds of the education level class, let's just call it class, um, are really being um, 
hard hit in this very respect. They're more likely to lose their jobs. Non-white older workers and women older workers are much more likely to lose their jobs now in this recession than white men. And so the inequality in this expectable life course, even the inequality in the expectable life span is just getting much worse. All those, those structural issues were already there and the COVID-19 has really accelerated the inequality. Um, what I really want to emphasize is that we in the profession have advised saving, but now rates have fallen. We've advised a mixed portfolio where you can use your human capital as well as your finance capital to kind of stretch to the end of your life in a comfortable way. And what Christine and Mark have said so well, and I really want to emphasize it, is that putting your labor and expecting yourself to earn money up until age 67, age 70 and delay drawing down your savings and delay collecting social security is not a good plan. It's very risky. It's not available for most workers. We just did research to show that um, non-white workers and women, if they do work to 64, to 65, to 66, they've already collected their social security at 62. Why? To make up for the low pay that older workers have. So saying you can just work longer, we're consigning people to sort of longer periods of precarity. Um, we're actually consigning them to jobs that haven't gotten easier. The computer has made those jobs more intense. And the warehouse work where older workers find themselves getting jobs, like in the Amazon warehouse, those jobs are increasing they probably add to more morbidity, um, more um, health damage. They haven't gotten physically easier. And older workers have a much harder time asking their employers for, um, you know, for accommodations. So this idea that you can put working longer into your portfolio in your plan, I think what we're getting out of this panel is that that's a very risky asset. And it's also an asset that's unequally available. Um, to people who aren't well educated and in really lucky jobs. Kedra, mm -hmm. you've you've dedicated so much time to this topic. Could you expand on it a little bit? And do you, could you talk a little bit about some of the things that could move the needle that the plans have put in place? I'm sure, I'm happy to talk about that. And I, I think I just want to highlight Teresa's point around de-averaging this view. It's so important not to think about by industry, but by age group, by gender, by potential life responsibilities out of work by education level by race we don't think about these individual segments if you will of our population we're going to we already have and we'll continue to leave leave people behind uh, and i'll go back to my original point around you know who receives retirement benefits black and latinx workers are overrepresented in service occupations where only about 50 percent of people in those occupations have retirement benefits. So most of the folks that we're talking about, they don't have DC plans, they don't have 401ks, they don't have those benefits. So they are really relying on their savings and other investments. Um, and when we talk about savings and other investments, we have to start to then also talk about debt. And so if we think about the average black or brown family, their savings level doesn't even really cover emergency expenses that might arise in a given year. And so of course, those individuals, again, to Teresa's point, we talk about the lower end of the spectrum are getting to retirement potentially without any savings. And so those social security benefits are so critical. Um, I think though, I think the question that we have to also start to think through is what innovation is really necessary in the industry to meet some of these needs? What can employers do? What can sponsors and other providers do? I mean, a couple of things that we've been thinking a lot about are how do you give people access to cash so they're not entering a debt spiral so they don't retire with massive amounts of debt that were taken on initially potentially for very reasonable expenses or emergency expenses. And so thinking about access to cash, access to earned salary, perhaps before a um, payroll date, emergency savings accounts. So let's say you're in an industry where you don't have retirement benefits. But what about employers providing emergency savings accounts that are, um, are tax-free? So really thinking through those types of solutions that start to reach, again, to Teresa's point, the set of folks that are not sitting 
in positions where they already have a 401k and are thinking about where do I invest that to get a higher return? They're thinking, how do I just create a cushion for myself and for my family? Uh, and that's what we're often faced when we talk about lower income and, and non-white communities. Teresa, I saw you raising your hand. Did you want to talk about emergency savings specifically or something else? And I don't want to, I don't want to um, step on what Mark was saying, but um, let's just talk about hope and plans. Um, Peter Buttigieg, um, who ran for president on the Democratic um, ticket, had a very comprehensive retirement and savings plan. And with something like this really quickly is that if we just make IRAs available to everybody, we're really confusing what Harry said at the very beginning, what savings are or what retirement is. You really have to segregate those. So he had a um, basically a thrift savings plan for everybody, a public option retirement plan, because Kedra's right. Um, to fix this system, we have to cover those who have nothing. Um, and so a, a universal um, thrift savings plan, that's the plan that federal workers have, or just a, a universal 401k for everybody. Employers contribute so that workers don't confuse that somehow they can take some of it out to remodel their kitchen or to, um, to send their kid to college. It's just for retirement, just like sort of the old defined benefit plan. Um, and then employers and workers together could decide that some of that would be um, siphoned off into an emergency savings plan. This looks like what unions uh, for low-income workers often negotiate, which is they get to get employer and the employee get together. They put money away for retirement, and then they create a credit union, you know, for the uh, a Christmas club, you know, or you know, a December club. So he had a plan that really puts a, a mandatory universal pension system on top of Social Security. That's done. You know, we've solved the accumulation problem. Um, employers pay a little bit more, um, they will be happy, especially the ones that already pay. They don't have to compete with bottom feeders who don't. Um, and we really have, and then we have a place where people can save emergency savings. And, and what Kedra said, and I want to put a bow on it, we have to uh, crack down on payday lenders and, and, and um, even provide a national pawn shop, you know, like other countries, but really think creatively about where people smooth out their um, consumption needs. That's not the credit card or a 21% um, or more um, other interest bearing account. It's our responsibility, really, uh, I'm just looking at the panel to rethink financial institutions that work for everybody. Christine, I saw you raise your hand, so start yeah. rethinking. Right now, I start love thinking. this topic of emergency funding. Um, and, you know, it's interesting when you look at the data on who has trouble with emergency funding, you can see that this problem really cuts across age bands. So certainly lower income workers have a difficult, have a hard time amassing an emergency fund. But the problem is there for higher income and middle income workers as well. So I feel like we can take one of the few home runs of the retirement industry over the past couple of decades, which is automation, automating and nudging contributions, and use it in the emergency savings context, where if you can help people automate those contributions, and if you can also give them a little bit of a mental accounting trick where they have this dedicated fund, you know, that basically says this is to be used for your car repair, your health bill that you couldn't cover out of your cash flow. That can be incredibly powerful. People really respond to certain forms of mental accounting, even though some of the behavioral economists would say, you know, mental accounting is not good. In certain contexts like this, I think it can be incredibly helpful. Mark, I see you raising yeah. your hand. Hands waving. Uh, yeah, uh, commenting, following on actually several of these comments, I think um, the implication of a lot of this is a need for kind of the more holistic view of the household. And it starts with getting incomes up, I think, frankly. You don't really want to then be putting money into retirement accounts if you're carrying uh, high rate debt. You know, I, I have lots of conversations with people just starting out in their careers about this. My, my own kids, their friends are that age, and, you know, they'll ask me, well, you know, I should be socking away all this money for retirement. And I always say, well, first, you know, tell me about your student loans and tell me about your credit cards. And if you're carrying those at high rates, putting money into a retirement account at this point fundamentally is debt finance saving, which is not a good idea. So, you know, this, we need to think more holistically about income coming to the household. Incomes are too low 
in the, in the certainly in the bottom half of, of households, maybe more. All these other pressures that are going on in households to manage debt, uh, to think about saving money to put send to kids to college and so forth. So you know, retirement saving is not the first uh, priority in my view. Uh, you got to get the house in order in other ways to start with. Kendra, in addition to the emergency savings options that companies are pushing, some companies are also trying to help their younger workers with student debt. Do you think that those programs can help move the needle in terms of getting people to save for retirement down the line? I mean, yeah, I think certainly to Mark's point around um, fixing your, your debt house, if you will, first before retirement savings is critical. And I think generally thinking through what are the channels in which we can reach people? What are the channels through which we can reach employees? That's part of the benefit of the 401k is that not only are you providing a vehicle for savings, but you're providing also a channel for financial education for the nudges that Christine talked about for some of that education. And I think, you know, employers are doing things like to your point, Lauren, points around student loans, providing financial coaching in some places, um, some employers have been really uh, innovative and, and really specific about thinking about pay equity and looking at pay equity studies across their organizations to fix some of the income issues as well that Mark raised. And so I think certainly employers play a really important role, especially, yes, the younger levels during this accumulation phase. I think the other thing that we're starting to think about is what about education around decumulation? We've talked a lot about accumulation on this discussion, and that is certainly critical to amass the assets that you can prior to retirement. But the other challenge that we see as well is that people, once they are retiring, don't necessarily have the guidance and connection to a platform that can provide that education around how to move through those following years following your retirement. Teresa. Yeah, um, I, I, I just want to, I, I want to just, um, bring a, a bigger idea is forget about nudge and automatic enrollment. We have seen that without shove, um, we will not have universal coverage. Um, we don't nudge Social Security. The um, um, other countries that get it right, like the Netherlands, like Denmark, they don't nudge into into advanced funding retirement. They um, they shove. They do it in different ways, like a universal union contract or. A plan, but it's just we need to get away from the voluntary and treat pension accumulation um, like we do Social Security. Um, I want to also ask the panel um, whether or not, uh, and I really agree with Kedra, employers are often left out of this discussion. They have a prisoner's dilemma problem. Um, because they can't coordinate, they are stuck with their own 401k plans. I had one big Fortune 10 um, company. Um, CEO tell me that they do better than any of their peers in terms of contribution rates, in terms of financial um, assets, but the best of their employees stay with them for only eight years or 10 years. And when they go someplace else, they take the money out or they go to an employer that isn't as good. And so everyone, every good employer is a prisoner to the system. They would want all the employers to be held to the same standard and they would want to make sure the ones that do care about their employees that when they went someplace else they were still covered so we need a national um, conversation about it i hope that the biden administration um, has a, a commission um, that follows actually marco rubio on the republican side um, cory booker on the and sherrod brown on the democratic side to really add a layer of retirement savings um, and then I know we're going to leave a lot of people out in the private sector, the retail brokers, the, um, the consultants that try to get employers to create financial plan, um, pamphlets. Maybe some of us will be out of business um, because we are so embedded in this voluntary, nudgy, incentive world. All these tax um, accountants will be out of business. But if you can um, take our special interests aside and subordinate it to the national interest, I think the way forward is clear that we shove everybody into a national um, advanced funded pension system. We can't do this on social security alone. Christine, I see you waving your hand. Yeah, I wanted to um, follow up on 
Kedra's comments about decumulation, which is an area that I work passionately on. Um, there is a lot that is suboptimal about the way that we're doing it today, where you retire and you're handed this bucket of money, assuming you've been able to save, and you're forced to figure it out. You're forced to figure out what you're invested in. You're forced to figure out how much is the right amount to take out per year. It's a lot of complicated decision-making that in many cases um, is being conducted by people who are not educated to make good decisions on their own behalf. And we also know that cognitive decline is a consideration among older adults. So there is a lot that is suboptimal about the way we're doing it now. I think that um, you know, maybe it's not, can't be productized in the same way that we've seen target date funds, for example, um, really simplify retirement savings for people, but at least perhaps it can be systematized where you can kind of have some sort of all-in-one solution that really does provide that paycheck that people were accustomed to having. And I think potentially it could also help people get over this behavioral mistake where they're very anchored on trying to wring current income from their portfolios, where we've got really low yields today. We've got a lot of people who might naturally just gun for whatever has a higher yield attached to it, which of course has a much higher risk level attached to it as well. So I happen to think that this is just an area that is ripe for improvement because there's a lot about what we're doing today that is really vexing for consumers. It's, it's too hard. Mark, you've written so much about all of these topics. Do you think that shoving would work? Yeah, I really wanted to comment on that because that's a very provocative uh, notion uh, that Teresa is putting forward. So I, I would comment and then a question back to <laughs> Teresa. Um, one is I think that there is room to do more in the Social Security system. You know, I think expansion of Social Security benefits, in my view, is a must. That is the national mandatory system we have now that works great. On the national mandatory savings side, Teresa, what I wanted to chat about there with you is, you know, A, I think something like that could be piggybacked on top of Social Security because I think that's the structure where it makes the most sense. But second, the, the one thing that worries me there that I'd love to hear your thoughts on is this. If we mandate it and start automatically taking out X percent from paychecks to go into this new system, you know, I wonder if we don't run into the problem of, um, you know, debt finance savings for households that are already pinched, where another's, like what I was talking about a few minutes ago, dollars start going to this new plan at the expense of debt reduction, setting aside dollars for, in other words, it seems to me that you got to have the holistic answer before you start just jamming money into a retirement accounts that maybe shouldn't be going there. Um, it, it's a, a great question. I have a, a easy answer. Um, we don't blink when we um, take money out of um, the young workers who might be in debt for Social Security. So we've already made the decision um, that it's just a mandate to set aside for our future selves. Actually, that's what civilized societies do is help people smooth out their consumption over their lifetime. We don't put it that way, but that's mm -hmm. what we do. Um, um, and also we do this for rich people with our $250 billion we spend on retirement incentives. That really is a gift to the upper income workers who would have saved mostly anyway. We could actually make sure that lower income workers who are um, forced to put either through their employer or just directly uh, another 1.5 or 3%, we should start small like they did in Australia, um, that we make sure that some of that uh, money that we already spend with gov with the government um, tax favoritism goes to the, those workers. So if uh. we, this is the Biden administration wants to do this, is reform that deduction into a refundable tax credit. So those workers need an employer match for sure. Those workers need higher pay for sure. So my plan doesn't come with take already the poverty level wages we now and take yeah. even any more out of it. Yeah. We need to have the refundable tax credit. So re redirect some of those uh, tax uh, savings yeah. or whatever tax expenditures. It's like well, check off, check off in his place, puts a gun on the table in the first act, and then uses it in the third. I'm putting the 250 billion dollars that we spend unfairly and effectively on our retirement benefits, and I'm going to put it into policy to help most people in in the third act. 
we're getting a ton of questions. So I want to go to Q&A just because I want to try to, I find that they're usually better than the ones that I'm going to ask anyway. Um, what's your advice to small businesses, the majority of whom um, hardly make enough to, um, you know, make it work, let alone save for retirement? Kedra, what would you say to a small business in 2020? How do you, how do you make a retirement plan work for you and for your employees? Well, I'll go back first to I, I certainly understand those challenges. And I think especially a lot of our small businesses today, we think about our small restaurants, other service businesses that have really been hit hard by COVID and the local shutdowns um, of their businesses. So I, I think we have to certainly acknowledge that. I'll, I'll go back to a point I made earlier. I think a lot of what Teresa is suggesting makes sense. I think one of the channels employers provide is financial coaching, financial education, helping employees understand some of these challenges that we're talking about. So I think at minimum, thinking about starting there is really critical. And I think it's interesting to see some of the investments in fintechs that are looking at this particular space around providing those types of platforms, provide that education and those vehicles to employees. And so I think probably where I would start on the small business lens, I'd love to hear from others as well though. Anybody else want to? Well, Harry, I just think, I think the oh. idea that Teresa's the idea that Teresa is discussing is from a policy standpoint is the answer for small businesses who have trouble with the administrative and cost side of running a four hundred one k plan. There, uh, these plans tend to be quite expensive for small businesses. So the best thing that could happen for small businesses would be to have their workers enrolled in a big national plan of that type. In my view, I realize that's not a specific answer to the tactical aspect of what a small business should do today, but I think that's the answer. No one has mentioned healthcare yet, and we actually do have a question about health savings accounts, but we all know as experts that um, even the best retirement plans can get um, completely derailed because of healthcare costs, particularly as you age. Um, Christine, do you want to address a little bit about how health, health, health savings accounts could help uh, broad, help make that gap smaller, or is there something else? that you think of that could help to help people save for retirement and pay for their health care. Yeah, such an important point. Um, health care is one of the hugest costs in retirement and um, generally increases from our working years in terms of out-of-pocket costs. Like most people in the personal finance space, I am a big fan of HSAs from the tax benefits um, that you do have the, the three tax benefits, pre-tax contributions, tax-free growth of your money, and then tax-free withdrawals for qualified health care expenses. So there's a lot to like, but we've been talking a lot about income inequality issues. And here, you know, when you look at um, HSAs and their benefits, they generally do accrue mostly to people who are more heavily taxed, who are in higher income uh, levels. So you, the joke is that HSAs are most appropriate for the healthy and wealthy, but it's really not a joke. It's pretty true when you look at the data that the, the people who are going to be able to take best advantage of an HSA would be people who have very few health care needs, very few health care outlays, and who can use non-HSA assets to pay for their health care expenses as they incur them. That's a pr pretty rarefied subset of people. So certainly for younger, wealthier, healthier workers, by all means, take advantage of the HSA. But in terms of health care costs in retirement for people who aren't in that rarefied subset, I think that um, they they need to avail themselves of, of other options. Mark, I know you know you spend a lot of time talking about health care spending, planning for yeah. retirement. Maybe you can chime in there. Yeah, like if you look at healthcare care expenses running at about two to three times general inflation. So when you look at the annual Social Security COLA just came out, yeah, it's like 1.3% COLA, cost of living adjustment for next year. The Medicare premium would have jumped a lot more than that for next year if it had not been capped by Congress as a COVID relief measure. But generally speaking, that's the disparity of the run rates. And so that's really... Uh, really concerning and we haven't really gotten a handle on that. So from a retirement planning standpoint, obviously thinking about inflation and the disproportionate impact of healthcare on the inflation that's gonna impact your household in retirement because older people spend more on, on healthcare. That's sort of an obvious point that you have to take it into account as part of your plan and try to work against that. Um, I have a question that I'd actually like to direct to Harry if that's okay with him. Um, because I think it's really well suited for you. 
It's as retirement income specialists, we believe that retirees need to work with a financial advisor who is a specialist in this area. What are retirement plan professionals doing to bring these specialists in and to do this kind of customized planning with participants? Yeah, I think what we see primarily being in the, the, the business of uh, working with individuals through the workplace, through their employers, all different size organizations, you know, given all the fiduciary rules, you know, et cetera, just the complexity of the system, we see pretty much every one of our employers work with some type of consultant or advisor as it relates to advising them on the fiduciary duties. All of those firms operate in different ways at the workplace. Some uh, offer individual services where they have the resources and the capabilities to meet with tens, hundreds, thousands of employees to provide kind of that one-on-one -on -one counseling and others specialize more at the employer level, uh, et cetera. So I think uh, you know, through the workplace, there's a whole host of, of options based on the employer, based on the workforce, based on the needs. And again, coming back to a lot of what's been discussed, a lot is driven by you know, plan design, setting up the right structures, making it as easy as possible for plan participants to drive outcomes in a, a very complex you know, industry. We, we, we like to say you know, people understand savings they don't necessarily understand or want to be an investment expert. They don't understand how to manage longevity risk that's hyper complicated. And there's ways to do that both through individual advisory services, if that's what the employer would like to do. And there's ways to do it maybe in a more generic and simplified manner um, if the employer doesn't have those types of resources uh, available to them. So I think today it's a wide spectrum of what we see employers uh, how they leverage and how they use their advisors, but advisors and consultants are involved in every employer we work with, just a, a varying range of services that they provide based on the firm and their specialty. Kedra, do you think that having financial advice could help move the needle in lower income communities or would it not make a difference? I think it would certainly make a difference. I think even Mark's simple point earlier about advising the 22 year olds graduated from college to say, you know, maybe it's not time to save, it's time to pay off debt. I think there's some, some what may seem simple lessons that we take for take advantage when we're on a higher income spectrum that we just kind of do automatically that I think on lower income spectrums, it's very difficult. It's very complex to um, not have enough income. It's a very complex balance to manage. I don't think we can even really fully conceive of what that's like on a day-to-day -day basis um, for, for most people uh, in the U.S. And so I think certainly access to um, that kind of coaching and, and maybe I'd be clear about, um, about coaching or education. We're not talking about literacy or education generically. We're talking about coaching for, for your individual circumstance and challenges that are individually affecting you. I think that is quite important and, and I think um, could be quite helpful to move, to move the needle. Um, but I, I don't, I want to get back to Teresa's point, and that's a very much a personal responsibility narrative that if you just had more education or coaching, you could, you could handle it better. But there are some real structural challenges that we have to face um, that are not up to any individual, um, and that coaching and education won't help. But I, I think it could help move the needle to some extent. Go ahead, um, Teresa. Yeah, Kedra, I can't agree with you more, and I think you are an amazing thinker about this. Um, why don't we press this a little bit further? Um, I just did a column where I looked at the um, budgeting advice for high income people and the budgeting advice for low income people. You just Google sort of both worlds and they're two different worlds. And clearly the budgeting um, uh, advice for lower income people has a much more, it's um, a much more direct um, attention and empathy to what just Kedra said. I think you actually said it better than all of these websites, but there's a deep, a, a deep um, culture in our society that blames the victim. And so um, to get, um, when you don't have enough money to cover your bills and you're made to think it's your fault for you're not, for going to a payday loan or for getting yourself into traps um, or not seeing what, um, what the fees are on your credit card, there's a deep sense of shame. And I think that's what the Consumer Financial you know, Protection Bureau was about and it hasn't lived up to its potential. And again, I think this is a federal regulation problem. We, just to shift it a little bit, just since I have the floor, we are now in a national torture session of older people. It's enrollment period for Medicare, 
And um, we are now targeting- Favorite time of year. Mark's yeah. favorite time of year is Medicare. Mark Mark, and it's also American. Other countries, rich countries, don't torture our elders the way we are doing because of that previous question about what we do about health care. We need a national solution to this. We've got to well, stop. The, yeah, so I just published a piece about this yesterday in the Sunday New York Times about what goes on with fall enrollment. And there's new research out from the Kaiser Family Foundation demonstrating that more than half of Medicare enrollees almost never recheck their Medicare coverage, which means that over time, their coverage gets out of tune. Why don't they wanna do it? The typical Medicare enrollee is wading through almost 60 different plan choices every year. Who wants to bother with that? So, you know, it's the system, the marketplace system for prescription drug and Medicare Advantage plans, which are things you purchase in different circumstances, depending who you are and what you've chosen at the initial point of a Medicare enrollment um, are so complex and it's built on the notion of competition choice will win out and give people the most efficient solutions. And yet the, the Kaiser research shows that it's a malfunctioning marketplace because the, the willing educated buyer ain't there. So this ideology of choice that's driven a lot of our retirement systems over the last four decades, in my view, needs to be re revisited because it's failing so many people. We have about 10 minutes and we still have a bunch of questions. I know, Christine, you wanted to say something. So if you can say it fast, I got, want to get some more questions. Sure, sure. Well, I just wanted to um, comment on the issue of uh, advice in the context of 401k plans. And I guess, you know, we are talking about very low return expectations, certainly on safe asset classes. I think U.S. equity investors should probably have tempered expectations about stocks at least over the next decade. So I think the key thing to keep in mind in the context of any advice giving is just whatever is, it, what's that going to cost? Because you have portfolios that might have very constrained returns, certainly over the next decade. And so there are a lot of mouths to feed. Um, Mark referenced inflation, taxes are a consideration, and fees, whether at the fund level or at the advice level, nick into whatever investors can expect to earn on their portfolio. So um, it's just something I wanna put out there that it's one of the most impactful ways to improve a plan is to just nickel and dime every step of the way um, at the fee level. We have a question about financial wellness, which I'm gonna to ask to Harry. And it's basically, um, if we increase education, particularly in communities where that need it the most, and incentivizing people to learn more about managing their money, could that move the needle? What do you think, Harry? I think the foundation it has been a, a lot of what's been discussed thus far. That as we think about, you know, workplace savings plans, you know, half half of American workers don't have access to a workplace retirement plan, so it really starts there, starts with coverage, and then it gets into a lot of the wage conversation that we've had uh, overall. I, I think one of, the, what, one of the things we see happening, both in kind of local communities with not-for-profits that we and you know, others uh, provide a lot of support for, is that the conversation is becoming mu much more holistic around the individual, uh, at least what we see uh, given our kind of workplace lens, which is just one of the lenses it used to be everything was done in a silo and an individual had to figure out 15 different major kind of life strategies. And it was very difficult uh, to connect the interdependency around them. I think one of the biggest drivers of financial wellness has been taking those verticals and making them horizontal and really looking at the individual on the, what we've discussed, budgeting and debt management, student loan savings and emergency savings Workplace retirement, if you have it available to you, credit card debt, what's the next best use of that next valuable dollar that's very hard to split and use? And I think financial wellness still early is evolving into a much more holistic view around the individual. And I do think a lot of local um, in-community uh, organizations who have the capability and the expertise you know, can play a meaningful role in providing um, uh, you know, financial debt budget counseling to their, uh, to their local communities who may or may not have access to uh, you know, uh, uh, services through the workplace. 
Kedra, I see a lot of head bobbing there. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on financial wellness and how can we actually make it better? I, I think, I mean, I think Carrie hit on, hit on a lot of it. And we've talked about financial education and financial coaching and getting into the community. I, I, maybe I would just emphasize some numbers here. I think 60% um, of black families don't have retirement savings. Um, the average retirement savings for a white family versus a black family is 5X. And so these are, these are massive gaps. And so I think it's really important to recognize that, yes, I think education plays a really important role, especially when you're managing a limited set of resources. I think that's absolutely critical. Um, and wellness being a topic that we talk about. I think we talk a lot about our health with our families and our friends. Oh, my back hurts. I have to go to the doctor to do this, this thing or that thing. We don't, actually, we don't actually talk about finances. That's not a welcome conversation amongst friends necessarily. And I think some of this, and I think Harry's raising it, is about making the conversation happen on a more regular basis, that it is something that we should all be talking about on a more regular basis, um, and that it is as commonplace as talking about our physical wellness as it is our financial wellness. Uh, and I think that's what a lot to Harry's point that the nonprofit community is, is doing is ensuring that those conversations are starting to happen and ensuring that those trusted advisors exist for people that may historically have considered money and finance and wealth more generally as a taboo topic. Okay, Teresa, I was just gonna ask another question, so be quick. Real quick, I, I really <laughs> wanna know if you think these philanthropic and these charity organizations can get to scale. Do we actually need to make this um, part of the a, a federal plan? In, in terms of in terms of education? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think so much of education is like, what are the channels that are available? And so these programs that Harry is talking about are, are opt-in. Did, did you go to that organization? Did you recognize that you had a need? So I think there's a big question of, to your point, Teresa, how do you shove people, shove that information to people versus having someone have to raise their hand and say that I need it? I think it's a, it's a really good question. We have less than five minutes left, but I think this is a really important question. With so many people temporarily unemployed, what advice do you have um, about their current retirement savings? What are the steps they should take if they get employed again, maybe they won't to make up for any losses in the market. Raise your hand if you want to answer it. Oh, good, Christine, you didn't raise your hand. Do you answer it? <laughs> well, you know, as, as the uh, question uh, probably alludes to, there are um, some escape hatches with the CARES Act that was passed in um, the first quarter that does give people access to their 401k and IRA assets. Um, prematurely, so prior to being of retirement age. And it's actually not a bad piece of legislation in that it allows the participant who goes in and takes money out to make themselves whole by paying back into the account as well as any taxes that were paid. Um, but I would say that would be a, a last resort, certainly, um, for people who have retirement savings if, if there are other sources of um, assets that they could could turn to before re before rating the retirement assets that that would be the first choice. Um, then, in terms of rebuilding, I think that um, people sometimes don't recognize that those last say ten years before retirement can be a really great time to play catch up. Whether people are unemployed or maybe have had college funding sort of on the front burner for um, that maybe their forties through fifties. Um, the person who wants to turbocharge retirement savings can take advantage of catch-up contributions when they become re-employed um, to try to really rebuild um, after having experienced some kind of job loss. I see Mark waving his hand. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I was going to add, for, for people who are, let's just say, prematurely retired, not necessarily going back to work, I think there's a few questions related to how you meet living expenses in the near term. So one certainly is, is there any way to get any kind of part-time income going that might just help pay the bills while you, for example, delay a social security filing, which can be very powerful. The other question to look at is, and this is a highly individualistic decision, but does it make sense to draw down those retirement savings near term to meet living expenses while you delay your social security claim or not? The social security question is kind of a money now versus money later question. But on the retirement savings side, if you are out of work and haven't filed for social security yet, you are in a lower tax bracket, which means that it's a relatively inexpensive time to draw down savings from tax deferred accounts. 
So you know, there's been a lot of research suggesting that that can be a very beneficial way to go for a few years, drawing down from savings to meet living costs while you delay a social security filing. I'm not saying it's universally the right answer, but those are sort of the levers one can analyze and think about. Great, we are getting near to the end of our hour. We've had so much to talk about. I'm making all of you retirement czar for a day. What's your one piece of advice that you would give to the next administration very fast? Christine, we'll start with you. Well, I think a simple way, I, I love um, Teresa's idea about the thrift savings plan, plan for the masses, but maybe a simple way before we get to a spot like that would be just to unify the, the IRA 401k contribution limit. So it's one contribution limit. If you don't have a 401k for whatever reason, you can supersize your IRA up to that combined level. I think that that would be a really easy fix to the fact that we've got a lot of people with no company retirement plan. All right, Kedra, faster than that. What's your one piece of advice? I'll go with emergency savings. I think this plan around how people having access to cash so they aren't taking out undue debt is just so critical here. Mark? There. Cut the Medicare enrollment age to 50 and expand Social Security. Teresa? Yep. Cut the Medicare age to 50. Make it the first payer to make older workers cheaper um, so that employers have a cheaper health plan for people over um, 50 and expand Social Security revenue as soon as possible. Harry, you're the last word. Uh, emergency savings and uh, more adding more income options to defined contribution plans to solve for the second half of the uh, intention of workplace retirement plans. And I really get to be the last word, the power of compounding people. You can start when you're young and you save, it really makes a difference in the end. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today, Christine, Kedra, Mark, Teresa, Harry, and everyone watching. I'm Lauren Young, this is Reuters.